Welcome to Spotlight on Chabot. My name is Katherine Pincus, and I'm here with Patricia Shannon. Welcome. Hi. Patricia is an instructor in philosophy and in mythology, yeah. Western mythology. Oh, no, global. World. Global I'm mythology. a world girl. Okay. And she's been an instructor at Chabot College full-time for over seven years, and I invited her here today to give us two overviews. First of all, I think a lot of our students don't really know what philosophy is or mythology, and that they might be very interested in learning more about that. And then secondly, what I'd like to address is the life of a teacher here at Chabot, because Patricia, you're extremely active in several areas. The first area that I know about is just the life of a teacher and trying to prepare and make sure that the, um, the, the work for the students is interesting and engaging, that's harder in topics that require thinking and active learning and listening and writing, than, and it's very different than, say, solving math problems. <laughs> and then the other part of it is uh, some of the other things you do to help the college continue to evolve and become more and more meaningful for the students. So, but let's start, first of all, how did you make your journey here to Chabot? Well, my journey is a kind of, um, probably more typical than most people would, would think. Um, we have um, mentors and advocates who bring us into things. And I grew up in a family. My grandmother was a teacher. My um, favorite uncle of all time was a teacher. And um, we all taught and teach in community colleges. We teach in community colleges because we believe it's the place where we make the most difference. That our students, our students here in Sh at Chabot and students in community colleges all over the country um, desperately need everything that a college education is going to give them. It gives it, the connections into a broader social world, the educational content um, of courses, as well as the financial difference it will make in their lives. It's the difference between being a million dollar um, earner and not. Oh, that's so important. And I think uh, it's really important for students to understand that, that the broader education not only gives them perspective, but gives them a breadth in life. And, um, and uh, so a large family of community college instructors. That's Three I'm a third generation teacher third of, at, generation. Com at community colleges. So tell us a little bit about philosophy. How do you get students interested in philosophy? Hmm, I don't know that students get interested in philosophy. I think they end up having to take the class because it fulfills a GE requirement. Okay, a GE requirement. And so there they show go. up and they, and, they, and they try to find a schedule, a, a class that's open, um, or they try to find a class that fills their schedule, which is why they end up not only in my philosophy class, but also in my mythology class, because it fits the schedule. Most students go, oh, Greek gods, you know, that's, that's fine, I'll go do that. Or philosophy, well, it's, you know, nature, human nature, God, okay, I can do that. And, and they show up, they have no idea, really, you know, what we're going to talk about or what they're going to study. And the idea that you could actually study philosophy or um, study mythology um, takes them by surprise. Um, so students come into my classes not really knowing what they're going to learn. Um, except that it'll probably involve, in the case of philosophy, Plato or Aristotle, and if it's in the case of mythology, they think it'll be Greek gods and goddesses. So what they end up learning is completely different. Um, what we do study is ideas um, about how we think about the structures and frameworks of our lives and why and how we make the decisions we make. Most people don't see that if you're a person, for example, who believes that there is a god, of whatever shape, kind, or description you want to imagine, then you're completely different from a person who doesn't believe there's a God, who believes everything is a, is a, is a determining cause and effect or scientifically explained universe where nothing happens by chance or intervention. It's a completely different framework. And if you make policy out of one or the other of those frameworks, it's completely different. So would you say this really also has an added benefit Patricia, of helping people understand other people who come from different walks of life and different ideas. Yes, because you encounter, for example, in my class, Philosophy 50 right now, we do 10 theories, 10 different ways of thinking about human beings and nature and God or not God. 
10, ten different ways of appropriating and 10 different frameworks for thinking about life. And then how does mythology fit into that? <laughs> mythology is my favorite class. It's just my favorite class. And it's my favorite class because, first of all, there's all those great characters on those great, um, great, great characters, heroes and gods and goddesses and tricksters and, and all of those things. Um, and they're all fun to read about and fun to play with, but it's even more fun to think about how they influence us. How are the stories that we read the shapers of how we think about the world? So in the end, mythology and philosophy are a lot alike because it's how we think about the world. Our mythology shapes our constructs. Now, it's very interesting, you know, as you said, uh, you named some of those characters. I was thinking how they even pervade current literature and current media. When you said the trickster, I immediately thought of Batman. I mean, it, it, this is, this is a, a continuum, isn't it, in mm -hmm. terms of the literature? The classic protagonist. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And so really learning that that's been in existence for a long time okay. and recognizing that is, is a real help to broadening your horizons. Well, and, and the other thing that happens is you can see how our understanding of various roles and, and characters changes over time. You know, one, one student did a, a paper for me about Superman and went back and looked at the Superman of mm -hmm. the late 40s and 50s emerging out of, out of, out of, out of comic books and then into the television series and the continuing series of comic books and looked at each decade comparing one issue of a comic from a decade with another decade That's and looked at how the change in our expectations of Superman well, and how that amazing. archetype has even changed our own perceptions and, and think about how our vision of those classic characters affects our own division our own visions of how we should be and who we should be in the world. Well, it sounds like something everybody should learn a little uh, bit about. I think so. <laughs> but like I said, it's my favorite class. <laughs> and so typically, Patricia, when you prepare for a class, why don't you tell students a little bit about what it takes to be a teacher and what kind of preparation is required? Mm. I think there are two pieces for me. And the first is that I steep myself in the reading that I've assigned. I've, 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 I mean, I've read a lot of material. Ever, before I ever come to teaching this particular class, I've read a lot of material. And in preparing this particular class, I choose material. In preparing for that particular lecture, I reread the, re the material that I've, uh, I've assigned students to read and, and remembering what the key things that I want them to walk away from the class remembering are. And then I think, OK, that's the core. That's what I want them to get today. And then the, qu the question I ask is, how can I help students today understand that? What, is, what are the analogies? What are the parallels? What are the metaphors? What are their common everyday experiences that are going to most connect with that idea in terms they're going to understand? So you're really weaving this fabric into the ever-changing world in which we're currently living so that you can help them understand the patterns of where we are now? I try. Um, I probably drive my students nuts because I'm always asking them, did they listen to the radio on the way in or did they hear on the news yesterday? Were they thinking about what does this mean if somebody announced this policy change or this change of legislation or these people who are running for election and are you paying attention to this and that? Because I try to weave those current events into the very thing we're trying to talk about today. And if we're talking about, for example, female archetypes, who are our female archetypes? Who are the 20 women who are in the news today? Um, and what do they tell us about our expectations about being a woman in 2009? Well, it sounds like an exciting class. It sounds <laughs> like one I think I'd even like to take. <laughs> um, when you get, give students assignments, I think it's a help for students to understand what we as teachers do, how we look at the assignments, and how we try to help our students with our feedback. Well, oh, I hope my students would tell you that um, assignments are almost always ab about telling me whether or not I'm communicating effectively. Okay. Um, did you get what I was trying to talk about? Did you, are you able to begin incorporating a new vocabulary and technical language, for example, that of philosophy, into your vocabulary? So right now we're at the latter half or the two-thirds point of the semester. And I'm expecting that my students are beginning to incorporate easily and readily um, the vocabulary of philosophy. 
So I'm not having to explain epistemology every single time I use the word. I'm not having to say, you know, ontology, the study of being. No, I just say ontology and keep on going. And that their writing is also reflecting that incorporation of a vocabulary, that they're beginning to use the terms with, with, with ease. Um, so their assignments, for the most part, are meant to demonstrate, A, that they're getting those key concepts that I was hoping to communicate during a lecture, that they're drawing on those key concepts from the reading, mm -hmm. and that their writing is, is beginning to, to speak the language of philosophy. And that's usually what my assignments are about. At the end, um, through, the, mid, through the, mid, the midterm and the final, I actually ask them to demonstrate clearly that they understand key concepts and can articulate an argument or frame the question. Sounds very challenging. Also very interesting. I hope. <laughs> now, I know, Patricia, you do other things at the school, and I know part of your focus, which I think is exceptional, is really thinking about the whole broader pattern of education for students. And you do things to help us as instructors as well as students. So why don't you tell us some of your other activities <laughs> that you're most proud of, that you're working on? I don't know about proud. Um, I think it's much more important to me at the moment to, to maybe say that sometimes students think that, that the only thing that we do is teach. And one of the things I'd like them to be aware of it. I'd like the community as a whole to be aware of it. It's, a, it's only a piece that in order for the institution as a whole to survive and thrive, we are constantly asking ourselves questions about how can we be better teachers? How can we make our processes run better? That is, could registration be more painless? Can enrollment be um, more painless? Can, can, this, can this work better than it does? Um, can we be better teachers? Can we help our students be better students? If so, how? Um, and most of the, commu the, the committees that I serve on tend to focus on those areas. I've worked with curriculum where we look at the courses that we teach and the new courses that we're developing and how to incorporate those into an existing set of courses for students that students take. And whether those new courses or old courses address the issues that students, and the content, I should say, that students need to learn, and how they fit into an existing pattern of courses, and what are the requirements, and what is it students really need to have when they graduate from this institution? What are the key things they have to have? What courses should they take? Should they only take things in a major? Should even students at a community college be thinking about majors? And there's all of that dialogue that goes on in and around curriculum. Um, and then there's, you know, how, does our, how do our facilities work? And why do we have a television station? And what kind of equipment do we have? And where do we get new equipment? And how do we pay for that new equipment? And teachers spend anywhere from 30 to 50% of their days answering all of the rest of those questions and being a part of a, of a dialogue with other administrators and staff and teachers trying to get the answers to those questions, which I think are huge and are often invisible. Yes, I think people don't realize really how much inquiry goes on all the time for us as instructors, not only about what we're doing with our students, but the whole broader field of knowledge hmm. and how we're, because we're at community college, we're able to help people kind of set the keystones for the rest of their educational uh, growth and development uh, in the community college at the college level. So it seems to me that blends beautifully with your work with philosophy and mythology. It's somehow all the state of inquiry. Um, and um, I think that's fascinating and wonderful. I hope that the students uh, have an opportunity to uh, take you, uh, one or, or more of your courses. I want to thank you so much for being here today. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. This is Katherine Pincus for Spotlight on Chabot.